We've got a great panel for you today, and we will be discussing the Earth Hack Challenge. And just to remind everyone, that challenge is to combine, repurpose, or modify existing technologies and products to create tomorrow's practical and scalable low carbon solutions for the home. I'll introduce the panel to you. We have Sir Richard Friend, the Cavendish Chair of Physics at the University of Cambridge. Sir Richard is a noted physicist and entrepreneur, and I will ask him to introduce himself a little further when he speaks. We have Sir Chris, Sir Chris Llewellyn Smith, Director of Energy Research at Oxford University and formerly Director General of CERN. Uh, we're joined by Matt Stanley of the Sustainability and Innovation Group at IKEA. And Matt works on the innovation team focused on identifying and enabling and building new sustainability related business opportunities for IKEA. On the panel with me now, we have Dan Perez, CEO of Marblar, Mark Kemba, CEO of the Climate Group, Will Ray, head of the Energy Design Center, Rockwall, and Robert Trezona, Business Development Director of IP Group and an experienced low carbon investment expert. So I would like to start by inviting Sir Richard to introduce us to his thoughts on the low carbon challenge. Well, the, thank you for the uh, opportunity to say some words. I should say a word or two more about myself. I'm a professor of physics, but I've been uh, much involved in trying to take uh, new areas of um, materials, uh, particularly plastic semiconductors, uh, from the laboratory out into the marketplace. And it turns out that these are materials which sort of naturally um, lend themselves potentially to uh, very efficient materials use and potentially very efficient um, energy usage. So I've thought a lot about um, what the opportunities are in uh, terms of using uh, materials and energy more efficiently. Uh, we can, and it goes without saying that the uh, the, the challenge of um, uh, ever increasing carbon dioxide levels um, is one that we, we have to take extremely seriously. Uh, but I think a lot of today's discussion is going to be more on the um, opportunities to uh, use what we want to use better, uh, more effectively, more efficiently. So it's an intriguing business looking at it um, uh, at the level of doing back of the envelope calculations to see just how well or how badly we use today's technologies. And what's really interesting is that there are some areas where a tiny improvement is something we think is absolutely fantastic. So a Formula One car that can knock a couple of tenths of a second off a, a lap circuit is miraculous. That sort of Red Bull doing better than McLaren um, at the moment. Um, or we look at the launch flight of the A350 um, uh, aircraft, which is projected to give is it a 15 or 25 percent improvement in fuel economy after perhaps a decade of extremely hard work. Those are wonderful technologies, uh, but what you see is that they are um, there are areas where small improvements um, are already pretty significant. But if you look in other areas of where we use stuff, uh, the headroom is much, much larger. We are way off where we possibly could be. So if we want to have a battery-powered car, uh, at the moment we would tend to use the lithium-ion batteries that were originally developed in effect for cell phones and laptops, but they're still 20 times heavier for the same amount of energy than petroleum fuel. It's a factor of 20 to win there. Lighting, well, the story of lighting uh, used to be uh, pretty grim. Uh, an incandescent light bulb, the sorts that uh, the European Union is increasingly forbidding us to buy and use, uh, turn about 10% of the electrical energy into useful light, uh, the other 90% is heat. Well, actually, there have been spectacular breakthroughs with uh, solid-state lighting with the gallium nitride LED, and now we have got a revolution taking place which is going to gain 
well, a fair fraction of that missing 90%, we will have transformed our efficiency with, um, with lighting. And I can run down the list if we look at solar cells um, converting sunlight into um, electricity. Uh, you can always pick and choose your figure of merit. The one that I like is how long does it take a solar cell, um, once it's sort of put on a roof, to repay the energy investment used to make it and put it there and wire it up to the grid. And the competition, of course, is, um, is photosynthesis, green leaves. Now, a green leaf, uh, when it uh, comes out in the spring, is almost certainly net energy positive within a month at most um, of, um, of, of appearing in the spring. Uh, otherwise, the plant wouldn't be able to grow. But today's silicon solar cells are still a few years on the roof before they've managed to repay their initial energy investment. So we've got a factor of, well, um, at least 10, maybe rather more than that, before we've got truly um, well-performing solar cells. And you can run down the list. Um, and what's so fascinating is to see that a lot of today's technologies that we, we think are rather good, and in many ways they are good, are actually way off where we could get them to if we sort of dared to think um, forward to the future. And I'll leave you with um, one that uh, we, uh, we always marvel at and sometimes wonder how much better it could be. Uh, but computing, IT, uh, we sort of expect it with Moore's Law that tells us how much better the performance gets, but actually Moore's Law, sort of a parallel of that is um, uh, how much more energy efficient each computation stage is. But we're probably a factor of a thousand away from where we should be if one looks at the fundamental limits set by how much energy you need to store a little bit of information and move it around. So we can probably look forward to huge increases in performance, um, uh, which may of course not necessarily be linked to huge increases in uh, uh, energy efficiency because of course we like more clock cycles. So that that's a perspective that I found interesting that we just look at um, uh, just check to see how far we could go if we really had the courage. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that. Uh, do we have any quick uh, responses from the panel? Well, first of all, um, Richard, uh, I, I really appreciate the, you, you kind of setting the scene there, especially when it comes to the opportunities. Um, I know as, as you and I have spoken before and, uh, and you know, a lot of what you, what you had mentioned, you know, there's, there's a huge opportunity uh, or like somewhat less opportunity in some areas, you know, aircrafts are actually pretty darn fuel efficient and we take, you know, spend 10, 15 years in the product cycle for Boeing or Lockheed Martin just to achieve 10, 15, you know, maybe 20% fuel efficiency. But um, in your opinion, you know, is there a lot of headroom in, in buildings? Is there a lot of headroom um, in, you know, some of the materials and some of the ways that we could, you know, reduce our carbon output in the home? Because, you know, for, from the sounds of it and from what I hope, um, that we're, we're actually aiming for a big target um, with this Earth Hack Sustainable Home initiative. Um, and having you guys on board is great. But in, in terms of headroom, is there many areas other than the home that have you know, such, such an opportunity? Well, I, I haven't really studied the home as much as I would have liked to have done. And I look forward to learning more about it um, through this. Uh, yes, there are huge opportunities. Uh, we use energy appallingly inefficiently in the home you know, at almost every level um, from um, uh, the way we ventilate ineffectively, the way we insulate ineffectively, the way we um, light in, uh, ineffectively. The, there are improvements uh, in almost every step. The big challenge is that we live in houses which were built some time ago and that will continue to be the case. So in the UK, we have lots of drafty Victorian houses with, uh, with, which don't have cavity wall insulation. So the challenge actually is retrofitting. Uh, new build is done rather well, um, and uh, building regulations do a good job. Um, retrofitting, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and that's where I think the fantastic opportunities for, for innovation. Sir Richard, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think Sir Richard has set out some real challenges there in terms of 
you know, getting, getting to that real potential of some of these technologies. Um, so Chris, uh, I, I know that the, the, science, the science community has a history of responding very positively to these grand challenges. So, so could we have your thoughts, please, on, on, on the challenge mode of innovation? Yes, certainly. Well, Richard's a very hard act to follow, so I'm not going to follow him. I'm going to move in a different direction. I'd like to start talking about the need to decarbonize generally and how difficult it is, and then say something about the nature of innovation, the role of challenges, and in particular the role of prizes ending up with Earthpack. Now, the reason most commonly given for why we should decarbonize is to reduce the danger of climate change, and that's obviously extremely important, and it is the primary reason. But it's not the only pre reason. Other reasons include uh, air pollution caused by burning fossil fuels, which I don't think receives enough attention. The World Health Organization thinks that urban outdoor air pollution is causing about 1.3 million premature deaths a year, typically eight years premature, eight years loss of life. And with the population density in Western Europe, a single modern coal power station in a 40-year lifetime probably causes around 8,000 premature deaths. That's much more than Chernobyl. And I think this isn't emphasized enough. Of course, climate change is the primary reason. Uh, Richard said it goes without saying, but I think I'm going to say it anyway, because this is the beginning of a discussion. Uh, and what I say to the uh, non-believers, although I'm not a climate scientist, uh, nobody doubts that burning fossil fuels is increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And physics that I learned in high school tells me that this will drive a temperature increase, which is easy to calculate. Uh, this, in turn, will increase the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere that will drive a further increase. And after that, we're in the hands of the climate models and those in their computer programs to estimate the feedbacks from changing cloud cover, changes in vegetation, etc. Now, my position is that unless somebody proves to me that these feedbacks all cancel out the first order effects, the ones I can understand without a computer, and in fact, it seems that their net effect is rather small, and as somebody can prove, I think we must take it very, very, very seriously. And that, I mean, that's, uh, I think, very, seems to me very obvious. So we need to decarbonize, but it's incredibly hard and we're doing very badly. Uh, nearly 80% of our primary energy comes from fossil fuels. And of the remainder, 10% is from burning waste and biomass, very little of which is carbon neutral. So there's mostly coming from uh, carbon fuels we're living on. If we exclude hydro, the other renewables, the ones that get the headlines, contributing a bit under 2%. So they've got to go up a factor of 40, which is an enormous amount. So the challenge is enormous. On paper, we can write down ways of dramatically reducing carbon um, emissions. For example, the International Energy Agency's green scenario has emissions down over 20% by 2030. Sounds great, but it's not happening. BP every year makes a realistic prediction up to tw uh, 2030, and it's very, very hard to be wrong on the 2030 timescale because, and Richard just said this about houses, most of the infrastructure is already there. And the BP prediction, instead of saying that emissions will go down 20%, which they could on paper, says they will go up 20%. So the, the challenge is enormous. Now I'd like to say something about the nature of innovation. Now a lot of innovation results from um, curiosity-driven research. Uh, X-rays, for example, were discovered with no thought of application, although they were being used very soon thereafter. But Although a lot comes from curiosity-driven research, there are many, many examples of innovation designed to solve particular problems. Possibly the most important on a world scale and the earliest one is the synthesis of ammonia driven by the need to artificially produce fertilizers on which the lives of billions of people depend today. And another one would be the development of the World Wide Web, which was simulated by the, stimulated by the need to get better communication between large groups working at CERN. So scientists, engineers, uh, innovators do do fundamental research, and it's very, very important, but they also do respond to challenges. Uh, what about prizes? Do they help? Well, if we look historically, 
The answer is definitely yes. The most famous prize of all, the sort of granddaddy of all innovation prizes, was the Longitude Prize announced by the British government in 1714. That offered £10,000 for a method of um, measuring longitude to an accuracy of 60 nautical miles, that's about 110 kilometers, £15,000 if you could do it to 40 nautical miles, and £20,000, an absolutely enormous amount of money in those days, for 30 nautical miles. It was eventually won by a humble clockmaker, John Harrison, although at the beginning such luminaries as Newton and Huygens, at the night when the prize was announced, said it would be impossible to make a clock or watch which could keep time to sufficient accuracy on a pitching ship. So, you know, the, the great brains are there, but the simple um, technician did it. I'm not saying that's always the case, but it could be. Another example of prizes is Lindbergh's flight from New York to Paris, which actually was stimulated by a $25,000 prize from the owner of a New York hotel. So experience says, yes, prizes uh, work, of course, in the 18th century, uh, the funding agencies weren't there, and today there are funding agencies that are funding money, pouring into money to every challenge you can think of. Is there still a role for prizes? Again, I think the answer is yes. The X Prize stimulated privately funded and highly innovative rocket launches, and the DARPA Prize for driverless vehicles stimulated lots and lots of good ideas. And by the way, the... Um, my government, the British government, to mark the hosting of the G8 summit meeting, which is now underway in Northern Ireland, is about to announce a new longitude prize of a million pounds, probably less than the value of the original, I'm correcting for inflation. I'm not sure exactly what it will be for, although in trailing the project the other day, our Prime Minister David Cameron mentioned a cure for dementia and zero carbon transatlantic flights. Actually, in April, I was at a brainstorming meeting at the Prime Minister's office residence, 10 Browning Street, on this prize. And I suggested that uh, one of the things I suggested was a prize for producing artificial meat with, say, 10% of the emissions involved in uh, growing real animals, uh, which would be indistinguishable in a blind test from real meat. But it was thought that that was not sufficiently sexy. Now, actually, I think it may be in the seemingly non-sexy areas, and some of them associated with buildings, where prizes could be used, particularly useful to stimulate thinking which, about areas that would otherwise not attract sufficient attention. For example, it would be tremendous if somebody could produce an insulating material for buildings with one-tenth of the thermal conductivity of materials now being marketed for much the same price. Um, I think the, mar and the material's got a vacuum, by the way. The challenge is getting it cheaply. Uh, and improvements in the energy efficiency of their buildings are, in fact, a superb topic for a prize, I think, for two reasons. Firstly, that 30% uh, of the world's primary energy is used in residential buildings, which are therefore a terrific place to start looking for very large energy savings. Secondly, I do think that old ideas and technologies and that's part of the idea of Earthpack, will have a role to play. We're not going to have hugely high-tech, difficult to set up and operate things in the home. And these technologies probably don't need large R&D investments, um, and they may be just thought up by very bright people who respond to this prize, and they may make a major, major contributions. And therefore, I was very, very pleased to be associated, asked to be associated with Earthpack, and I believe that it will stimulate uh, novel applications of existing technologies that will lower our energy bills, decrease carbon emissions, and if to end I can be a bit pompous, ensure a better world for my grandchildren. Thank you. So, so Chris, thank, thank you very much indeed. So have any of the panel members got any immediate response to that? Uh, Robert, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sir Chris. That was a fantastic introduction. Um, I've been involved in uh, low carbon innovation for about 10 years now. And I think part of the ethos behind the Earth Hack is really looking for um, unexpected innovation uh, that wouldn't otherwise have been discovered. And in particular in the context of people's homes, uh, where you know, a lot of mundane activity goes on, people are you know, just not really thinking about their home as a high-tech environment. Um, I think there's a great opportunity to bring together thousands of people uh, from the Marbler community to think through uh, new ways of giving um, 
people in their homes ways of saving energy uh, and reducing emissions. Uh, and this is starting to happen. So uh, there's a product called Nest, which is a new type of thermostat. Uh, thermostats are about as unsexy um, a product as you can get. Uh, but when um, an ex-Apple designer gets hold of the concept, um, you start to develop quite a nice um, a product that's seeing a lot of traction. And I think um, we, we've deliberately set the, the boundary conditions on the competition uh, for ideas that could be realized in a year or less. And it's really trying to focus people's minds uh, on solutions that deliver value to consumers could be realized quite quickly uh, and also allow people from a broader range of backgrounds to participate. So we have lots of scientists and engineers, um, some, of, some of whom are very um, you know, working directly in climate change technology, but there are lots of other people participating in the challenge uh, from different backgrounds uh, coming up with really quite um, sort of out-of-the-box ideas. Uh, and that can have a huge impact. Uh, and I think some of the things we need to do in homes um, are not difficult. It's about giving people better information about the energy they're using and more control about how that, that, that energy uh, is, is being used. Thanks very much. Thank you, Robert. Um, so actually, just to interject, uh, first of all, th thank you, Robert, and, and Sir Chris and uh, Sir Richard uh, for your contribution. And, and Sir Chris, it, going kind of looping back a bit towards those innovation prizes, um, what really struck me as well, and you know, one of the one of the, the goals behind EarthHack and Marbler generally is you know trying to tackle these big problems and involving a wider audience. And uh, Sir Chris, so the, the Longitude Prize, which is you know, as you mentioned, that granddaddy of, of these of, of these prize driven innovations. It wasn't won exactly by a scientist, was it? As you mentioned, it was won by a watchmaker. The, these sorts of atyp the, these solutions coming from these atypical sources and um, in your opinion, and, and, and Sir Richard as well, a, a, you know, Richard being from, from Cambridge and, uh, and Chris from Oxford, I mean, you're, you're around ideas all the time. Do we have to just reach into the science community to, to, the, to academia um, to get these solutions or, um, you know, or should, should people who are working in this space kind of cast a wider net? So Chris, may I ask you to respond first? Yeah, I think it, it, it depends what you're looking at. I mean, if you want a better photovoltaic cell, probably you need to tap into the academic community. But in things in the home, I don't think that's the case. We all live in homes, we think about our homes. And I think, as I said, these solutions, if they're going to be adopted, adapt, uh, they've adopted, they have to be relatively simple. And in fact, that's one of the big challenges is the social science challenge of making people take up these things. I mean, the, the energy savings that are available in, on paper are not actually being realized, and there are big um, research problems there in the social sciences, as well as introducing new technologies. But I do think that they could come from uh, non-professional scientists, some of these things in the home. Thank you. Um, so, Richard, uh, your, your thoughts on that, please? Uh, well, I, I agree with, uh, with, uh, with Chris um, that uh, it isn't just for uh, uh, th those who call themselves researchers to, to find the solutions. And I, I think what's often the, the big opportunity is discovering, re appreciating that something, uh, a solution to a problem that's um, in one area can be translated to another area. Um, so I mean, the example I gave earlier of lithium ion batteries, which, which now sort of find their way into cars, well, the reason they were developed was because people wanted portable electronics, not portable cars. Uh, if you, the, the example that um, Robert uh, Trezona mentioned of um, thermostats, um, pe people who, who sort of install thermostats don't know how to use Green's functions to calculate response functions to uh, the thermal properties of uh, rooms, but uh, people who from other areas of uh, engineering do and it's just translating knowledge or appreciating how solutions um, can be used in innovative ways that can probably bring huge uh, huge wins. Could I add something to that? Absolutely. Go ahead. I can't hear anybody anymore. Go ahead Sir Chris. Can you hear oh, okay. Me? I was going to say that I think another thing is that by involving, if you can succeed in involving people in this prize, it will make them think about their behavior with relation to energy. I mean, a lot of, um, you know, small-scale renewables, putting a photovoltaics on your roof, in the UK, it probably doesn't make all that much sense, but it makes people energy conscious, and they start thinking about their use in other ways. 
And I think that, you know, if you start people thinking about how to win this prize, they may not win the prize, but they will start thinking about how they use their energy and change their behavior, and maybe turn down the thermostat or do other things. Thank you. I, I think that's a, that's a great point. And you know, on this theme, I think it's always worth remembering that, as I understand it, uh, Skype started out as a smart aggregation of existing technologies, not as a, a fundamental new innovation in itself. So, Dan, um, the challenge has been set, a lot of work to be done. You know, what's your vision for the Earth Hack and, and for Marblar? Sure, and uh, well, th thanks so much, Ben. We're, we're so so Marbler, you know, to, to step back as people know, what we do, we use challenge-driven innovation to find new ways to use existing technology. And to give you guys a bit of history behind EarthHack, um, we started talking to to Ben and Mark Henber here at the Climate Group, thinking, you know, the Climate Group is always looking for, you know, to demonstrate the opportunities around. Um, a lower carbon future and that you know it's not just about doom and gloom but there's opportunities out there for for cities for municipalities for countries and for a lot of businesses um, and we thought you know how can we marry these two platforms together um, given that they they seem that you know if we got clever they could be very very complementary and that was kind of what uh, how earth hack happened you know to try to reimagine existing technologies towards creating these lower carbon solutions and so what we're doing with earth hack is you know, and what, you know, I hope all of you listening at home and, you know, at work um, is to look around you. What, what, what exists out there? Or could you, could you think of some existing products that might be used in, in transport or in manufacturing settings or um, in and, and the office or even already at the home um, that you could then repurpose and kind of plug in to try to, try to reduce the energy use? And we've already gotten, and we'll go into a few of these ideas later, several ideas on, uh, on uh, EarthHack from, you know, covering all aspects of the home. But the, the real goal is, again, and, and Chris really touched on it very, very well, is to, to engage a wider audience, not just scientists and engineers, but just to, to spark this conversation that, hey, you, you don't have to be a scientist or engineer to, to, to be thinking about these issues. And even if you don't win, um, even if, you're, if you don't even submit an idea, we're hoping that you take a look at some of these existing ideas, comment on other people's ideas, vote for your favorites, and just you know, leave the competition more informed about you know, what you know, some of these issues that are out there, some of these ideas that are out there, and some of the, the areas of the home that we could try and improve upon. And I know we'll be hearing quite a bit from, from Matt Stanley, from Ikea, and hopefully Harry from, from Phillips as well, um, about you know, uh, how we can make these ideas scalable, how we, you know, what, what somebody like IKEA is looking for to, to deploy these ideas in their stores and in, online um, to, to get these to, to the many people because um, that's where it's going to make the biggest impact. And that was also very important for us at Marbler as well as at the Climate Group to work with such innovative partners who really, really care about doing this. And IKEA and Philips are, are two key cogs, uh, you know, critical cogs to the, to the Earth Act because these, uh, these are two partners that are going to be looking at these ideas and providing a, a commercial perspective because ultimately if it's not commercially feasible, then we can't deploy these ideas. And so we're really, really excited to have Ikea and Phillips on board. And you know, everybody at home, you're going to be really lucky to hear from, um, hear from Matt in just a bit. Um, ben, did you have anything to add to that? I think just to say that at the Climate Group, we're, we couldn't be more delighted to be involved in this challenge. Um, as has been already said, uh, dealing with climate change is a huge issue. We, we've got to get it done. And you know, I, I personally don't want to wait around for someone else to come up with solutions. I, I'd much rather be part of you know, making progress, stimulating ideas. I, I think participation spreads the word about the challenge, its importance, uh, and the fact we, we, we can't leave it to other people. We can't leave it just to politicians. We can't leave it just to you know, high-level labs. I think we all should get involved, put in the ideas, you know, join in the creativity, and also, and maybe most importantly, it might be fun. Uh, well, no, no, it, well, it's not that it might be fun. It is absolutely fun. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're hoping everybody, everybody gets involved. And, um, and it's true. It, you know, it's a big problem. It's a global problem. And that's why we, we, we need a global solution. And the Earth Hack is what we hope is one of those truly global solutions engaging a, a global audience and, uh, and some global corporates such as IKEA and Phillips. So just remind me, Dan, 
how many countries are the Marble Art community drawn from who are participating in the challenge? Oh, thank you so much. So la last we checked for, for Marble overall, we have over 100 countries that have signed up for, uh, to Marble, including the newest country. We have several sign-ups uh, in the last couple of months from South Sudan, which we're very, very excited yes. about, um, from the oldest countries in the world in, in, in Asia and such. And so we actually have um, people from around the world interacting, and some of, the, some of the best ideas might be submitted by a student in Vienna, and it might be, you know, you know, added and plumped out by uh, by an engineer in, in Palo Alto, uh, voted upon by by a, a, a somebody else in, in Africa or India, and you, what, what you have is a is a is an ability um, to look at all the ideas because all ideas are public on Marbler, and you could build upon all of them, and so nothing nothing's private. We're all there, kind of working together and um, uh, trying to add some heft uh, behind each of these and plump them all out, and nobody nobody's trying to judge anybody else. We're just trying to to come at uh, at some some promising solutions. Right. Robert, you, I mean, you're you're an investor. What what appeals to you about the the EarthHack model and the Marblar platform? Well, I should mention that I'm actually an investor in Marblar itself, so I've got an interest there. Um, and so I, I guess it's like that razor advert. I, I like the idea so much. Uh, I bought some of the company. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we, um, we we think Marblar is very exciting uh, and. Um, I think generally working with small companies, uh, what's happened in the last uh, 10, 20 years is the sort of cost of becoming an entrepreneur, pursuing your own idea has come down significantly. So people have been able to set up uh, web-based startups uh, increasingly cheaply. Uh, now people with additive manufacturing are able to set up manufacturing-based startups very easily. Uh, and the, the sort of barriers that blocked um, the best ideas from the ways in which those ideas could get sort of uh, popularized and invested in are, are coming down. Um, so, so we think that uh, platforms that allow talents <coughs> and ideas to be communicated uh, are very exciting. Uh, we also, um, in terms of looking at, at sort of successful venture investments, uh, very often it's about a couple of people coming together with different perspectives in the world. And sometimes that's an academic and an entrepreneur, uh, but there have been all sorts of um, serendipitous uh, encounters that have led to great companies and great products. Um, what Marvler does uh, uh, really quite impressively well is um, it allows those interactions to happen very quickly in a very large scale. Um, so if you're on the platform, have a look around, um, you're seeing all sorts of people uh, from all over the world from these hundred countries uh, working together on these ideas, which is really inspiring. Uh, and we're hoping uh, lots of things will happen. We're hoping Marble will become a valuable company, but we're also hoping that it will give uh, rise to new companies that, that could be invested in. And specifically this challenge, um, we think that the whole low-carbon clean tech area is, um, is going through kind of a, at the bottom of a dip at the moment. It's about to come out the other side. And we're looking for um, exciting ideas that could be investable uh, from the competition as well. Um, not the only time this has been done, um, there have been quite a few of these competitions. Um, they don't always uh, lead directly to investments. Uh, but I think the points that have been made already about um, informing and, and energizing a community are, are really interesting. Uh, and I, I, I see relationships being created on Marbler that, that could turn into ideas, could turn into products. Uh, so it's fascinating to watch. Um, and. Really, when it comes down to it, um, small, um, successful startups are all about people. Uh, and Marbler and the Earth Hack is very much a, a, about people being energized and spending their time uh, trying to do something about climate change. Thank you, Robert. But of course, um, I think as everybody has recognized, whether implicitly or explicitly in this discussion, uh, none of this matters unless the innovations are brought to scale. And that's where I'd like to bring in Matt Stanley from IKEA. We, we, we couldn't be more pleased to have IKEA involved in supporting the challenge. I'd like to ask Matt to tell us a little bit about IKEA's approach <coughs> to innovation and, and you know, what, what you see in, in the EarthHack Challenge, Matt. Over to you. Sure. So um, for those, most of you should probably know of IKEA. Most many of you will probably have visited IKEA at least once in your life, um, probably have a piece of furniture from IKEA. Um, IKEA, just a bit of context, is a Swedish company. Um, we have about 340 stores around the world. Um, we are still a relatively small player in the grand scheme of things. But nonetheless, we have a, a scalable footprint, and I'll, and I'll address that in a few minutes. Um, 
there's when I think of IKEA and why we're doing this, and to add some um, add to Chris and to Richard's comments earlier, there's really four numbers that we think about at IKEA and why we are doing some of the investments and changes in our business um, and why we want to help customers. The first number is one and a half, and we look at that as the ecological footprint that we are currently consuming in terms of the number of planets. So we already consume well past what we are currently able to produce on an annual basis. The second number is three, and that's three billion customers or customers or people that will be coming out of poverty by the age of, by 2025. Those are new people coming out of new customer, new potential customers to IKEA and many people who are going to consume, and that's at three billion is a huge number that we are trying to struggle with. Right now we have somewhere between one to two billion people who are probably actively able to consume um, at, a, at a Western level. Six is the number of, that we are potentially heading to in towards a, a global average temperature rise. We can debate whether it's three, four, five, six, but we know that it's not zero and definitely not probably going to be one or two degrees, which is um, what we are on track to pass. And 12 is the number of cities that in 1900 um, had more than a million people. But in, right now, that number is equal to 500 cities that have more than a million people in it. And that is a rapid urbanization that is going on right now. And the ability to fulfill those consumers and how those people will choose to live, the ability for, to help fulfill their lives, will have a dramatic increase on the impact of resources, on the impact on energy, on the impact on materials. And we need to be thinking more creatively of actually how we address these solutions at scale. IKEA, for context, we have about um, 700 million people that visit IKEA stores on an annual basis. Um, we have growth ambitions that will take that to probably one and a half billion people in the course of the next eight to 10 years. Um, so we have access. Um, but some of the challenges, if we go back to the numbers that we just look at, we need to be thinking about solutions that are proportional to the challenges that we are facing. Doing a little bit is good and doing a little bit for everyone is great. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we need to be finding scalable solutions that drive significant changes. And if I look at one of the disruptions that we talked about earlier actually is <clears throat> LED technology. And you know, 85% more energy efficient than traditional incandescents and um, rapidly becoming affordable. By 2016, IKEA will only have LED technology within our range. All of our lighting, all of our other lighting technology will be phased out over the course of the next two to three years. And that has a major impact on every one of our consumers that chooses to shop for their lighting needs and the ability for then us to support customers to drive their energy um, efficiency at home. So um, for us, <clears throat> there are three or four types of solutions that, and or considerations that we're looking for when we um, are looking working with the climate group in Marblock. Um, we're looking for affordable solutions at the end of the day. We are a company that is stands for the many people. The vision of IKEA is to make it to create a better everyday life for the many people and that's all around, you know, we need volume and we need scale in order to do that. But affordability is paramount to making that happen. Scalability is the second bit. And scale, when we look at markets, we look at a global reach. And so finding solutions that apply within a region or within a city are not that interesting to IT in the grand scheme of things unless they can be scaled to um, a global platform. We want to find, to, I think it was it, Chris's or Richard's comment, um, simple solutions. These are solutions that can be readily adopted um, without a um, PhD in physics to be able to um, install in their home or understand how it is to be used. This needs to be accessible and it needs to be affordable and it needs to be simple. And I think the, I mean, the fourth dimension for us is it needs to be sustainable. These solutions that we're trying to design need to solve an issue. And whether that's energy efficiency or whether that's water purification or whether that's clean air or whether that's building insulation, um, we want to find an issue and many issues that our customers are facing at home, specifically within the built environment, that we can address through finding scalable solutions. So, um, <clears throat> you know, the, why are we participating with Marblar and the Climate Group? From my perspective, um, we're, IKEA is a uh, home furnishings company, and it always has been, but we're encroaching on areas where we uh, 
need to because it is ultimately how we're going to continue to access our customer base. But it's areas where we tend to not have the competency or we don't have the expertise. So, you know, if I look at small scale energy or distributed energy generation, these are areas in which we can see an application or a role for IKEA, but we don't traditionally have the competency in house. So when we look externally, we want to be finding and tapping into a resource base that is actually able to support us in this journey that we, IKEA is going on. Um, one of the things that is important, if I look back, is it's not just about the idea. Um, innovation can happen in a multitude of different ways, and innovation at IKEA often happens when we talk about scale and looking at an end-to-end -end value chain of how you produce a product. So the idea is one thing, but actually taking that to market um, is a completely different um, way of thinking. And I think it's really important to think when you're building a product or building up an idea, that you need to think about all the different dimensions of how this is going to hit a customer, where it's produced, what type of material is going to be produced, how it's going to be transported, um, how the customer will actually interact with it once it gets to their home, um, all of these considerations need to be taken into, into, into your consideration as a, as a, within the Mar Black community if it's ultimately going to land in an IKEA shop. Um, so, you know, but, but we're tapping into a new area. We're tapping into new areas of expertise, and we ultimately want the support of these communities to be able to do that and to bring markets to, to, the, to bring products to market. Um, if I, going back to just a, one other example, I think of, of um, there's, a, there's lots of examples we can talk to you about IKEA. Um, some of the products at IKEA, LEDs is one. Induction hubs are another for cooking. Right now, induction hubs um, cook the energy um, transferred to the pot and to actually cook the food is approximately 80% of the energy used. And that's compared to traditional gas or electric, um, is a significant improvement. These are things that we can do as a company by just enabling customers to have affordable induction hubs or affordable energy efficiency solutions we can bring those to market. And um, those are the types of solutions that we want and things that you as a customer can go in and be able to pick up and install at home and automatically start benefiting from that. So um, I'll probably, I'll stop there for now, but a scalable, affordable, um, and simple is probably the three words that we're looking for. Thank you very much indeed. So um, panelists, a response to that, a, a, a very frank statement of what IKEA is about. Can we respond? Oh, well, I, I guess my uh, my immediate thoughts, um, and maybe I could I, I could have uh, Sir Chris and Sir uh, Sir Richard also uh, dip in here. Is like you know when we're talking about some some high in academic research, and we're trying to uh, to to nail some of these problems because. It's, it's happening in academia, it's happening in Oxford and Cambridge and London in the US, ever, uh, in Europe, everywhere where people are trying to, to address some of these, um, uh, these problems with new technologies. Um, so Chris, Richard, how often in academia are we thinking commercially like that? You know, um, and, and you know, where we're thinking when we're doing some of this research, trying to develop these new technologies, um, where we're thinking about you know, if this is eventually going to be deployed, you know, are, are, the, are we um, in the lab, in the university, thinking affordability, scalability, making things simple? Um, from the get-go, or should we start having you know conversations with industry much earlier when we're developing these new technologies? So, Sir Richard, would you like to go first on that one? Uh, yes. Uh, well, that, that's a really good question, and and I actually I think it reveals. Um, let me be positive and call it an opportunity. I think this is something we don't sort of. It's not part of the culture as strongly as it could be. Um, I, we we perhaps spend too much time sort of. Um, uh, paying tribute to the sort of grand upscale, uh, upstream um, breakthroughs in science um, and just fail to um, get across just how important it is to get those connections to the real world and you know, the simpler the better. So uh, whenever I see that happening and, and there are good activities in Cambridge which do get uh, the student body you know, acquainted with this, um, I see you know, tremendous appetite, tremendous recognition of what the issue is. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's, I see that as a big opportunity where we can, we could do better. There's headroom there, Richard. You want me to call him? Yes, please. Yes, please uh, so, I, I, I agree with Richard, it's a very good question. I think it's very varied. I can speak for Oxford, but it sounds like it's similar in Cambridge. Some of my colleagues are very much challenge driven. They are thinking about um, solutions that will help the world. Others 
are motivated purely by trying to understand nature, and that's great too. Uh, both are needed. I think the, the, the big missing part is that some of the people who are thinking fundamentally are thinking about scaling up. They always have it at the back of our mind, their minds. And one of the, my colleagues, the head of our materials department, if you ask him, what is your department ab about? He says, his answer is scaling up. And that's great. But there are other areas where people really don't think about scaling up. I mean, they like to say we're working on energy because it sounds great get some funding, but they really don't think about scaling up. That doesn't mean they're not doing very good science, but uh, you know, if, if you want to contribute, you've got to have at the back of your mind all along scaling up. And the more we can get this across to the students, we're trying to do that through our student energy society, through lectures we're running for graduate students on innovation and on energy, to get them in the frame of mind of, uh, you know, don't don't ignore the fundamentals, but when you come across something that might be used, start thinking about scaling up. It's a challenge, though. I think for us, though, the, the main challenge has um, historically been that we haven't been as close to the academic community at mm. IKEA. Um, and, you know, these types of environments where we can actually start to bridge the gap between academia and um, customer hands or customers' homes, um, is a really important exercise that we as a company need to go through. And I think academia needs to get a bit closer in some areas as well um, to thinking about the, the direct application or potential applications of this of their research in the market. Thank you, Matt. We are trying to... Oh, oh, no. Go ahead, please. I said we are trying to get in there by organizing series of dinners where we get together people. Actually, building was one of the ones we were thinking about. Uh, where we get together people from industry and academia to share what they see as the problems. And, and that will stimulate thinking on both sides, we think. Yep. Thank you. Mark, um, innovation, scale, uh, I, I know that that's something the climate group have been thinking about. So, you know, what, what's your response? Is, 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 are, are we just talking or, you know, how, how can we make this happen? Well, we're in a kind of paradoxical situation at the moment in that, I think as other speakers have mentioned, uh, global greenhouse gases emissions continue to rise. Last year was the highest year ever. Uh, we are way past, well, we're past 400 parts per million uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, which was a threshold that not long ago people said that it was the point that thou shalt not pass. At the same time, however, we know that uh, we have about three quarters of the technology that we, all, we need already, maybe not being deployed uh, appropriately that we need whether well, the technology we need to get on a sustainable emissions path by 2020 most of its in use somewhere the policies are in place somewhere uh, the ideas are there and it's innovation not only about uh, new technologies and this is where Marbra and some of the other work that we're doing is really interesting it's looking at how can we take what exists already and deploy it much more smartly because I think uh, you know, it was Sir Chris earlier, or, or, or Sir Chris or Richard earlier said, uh, yes, we've got these scenarios of a 20% reduction and a 20% uh, increase in emissions depending on whether you look at what exists or what might exist. I would argue that actually if we take what we can, what we have already, we can get to the, re the reduction tra trajectory by being smarter about how we use it, where we use it, and when we use it. And this is where innovation challenges like this one, I think, have a huge part part to play. Globally, for the climate group, we're looking at a broad suite of innovation opportunities and options. We work with the National Dutch Postcode Lottery on a very early stage technology innovation challenge. We work with Living Labs globally to look at innovation challenges to support cities' low carbon aspirations. And Marbla, the Earth Act, is a, a complement to that part of a, a growing suite of activities. Innovation across, as I say, not only technology but business models understanding uses, and that requires collaboration across sectors and between people who wouldn't necessarily have been involved in the past. So breaking out of the traditional innovation thing or sphere into new ways. And this, I think this is why this is very exciting for the group. Thank, thank you, Mark. Will, using, using technology smarter, that sounds like a cue for you. Yeah, I, I, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I guess in terms of uh, you know, some of the technology areas that I'm personally interested in, and, and also you know, my company is interested in, and the building industry as a whole is interested in, is, is there, there are probably three areas I see, uh, web and digital technology, 
uh, and slightly related to that, the idea of, of smart, smart systems. And I say smart systems for simple people, and I can, I can explain a bit more about that. And the third area is probably uh, I like in terms of energy efficiency is really the idea of passive components. So to kind of cut through those, I, I mean, uh, buildings are often the last place for, for innovation. Um, they're not, uh, buildings are relatively cheap, uh, they're large scale. So you know you don't uh, you don't tend to see the high tech uh, materials or technologies applied there first, and they're in higher value areas. So uh, things like web and digital technology, which is broken through in a lot of other spheres, I think has a, a big role to play. You know what what the web's really good at is is answering very complex questions uh, very quickly and very simply. Uh, I think that in terms of trying to work out and diagnose as a, as a consumer where your problems are with your building and where's your energy going, how much energy are you using, is it a lot, is it a little, <clears throat> how can you fix it, I mean that's, a, that's quite a tricky question and actually using web and digital technology combining sensors, big data, sharing uh, platforms, open data sources from governments and, and, and other areas and all in the sort of framework of a kind of consumer friendly application I think is, you know, that's a really exciting area where you can take the, the digital world and put it into the physical building world. Um, smart systems, I mean Rob's already mentioned Nest and the, 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 the thermostatic, contro uh, thermostat control that they've developed. But the idea that uh, smart systems have been tried a lot in buildings and, you know, often they don't work. There are sort of like a 747 control system for a very simple kind of, you know, 90-year-old grandmother. It's not going to work. You need something that, that does all that complex and, and complicated stuff in the background. It just needs to be a, a simple and do the job up front and actually work. So smart systems for simple people. Um, the third area I like is, is, is passive components. And when I say passive, I mean um, components that sit there. They don't have any machinery. They don't have any uh, 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 electricity required, no heat required. It's the, it's the insulation in a building. It's the structure. It's the windows, the doors, everything else. Um, in this area, you know, there's, there's been no work for over time. You've been able to build a relatively well insulated, airtight, um, thermally efficient building for low heating and cooling for a number of years, but it's been chunky, it's been expensive, it's been not really a very good looking in terms of design. Um, so now what are people thinking about? Non-traditional materials, composite materials, phase change materials, um, and also taking uh, non-traditional materials and giving them you know, multiple functions, looking at not just you know, one material serving one function, but one material serving lots of different functions, the structure and the insulation, the lighting and the, you know, keeping the water out. Um, you know, how can you take these, these passive systems as well and, and, and really just take out the active systems totally? Uh, so I think that's, that's really interesting. And, and interestingly, you know, with this kind of alignment to IKEA, you know, they've really done this sort of innovation in thinking about different materials in, in home furnishings and home products, you know, the use of plastics a bit more in areas that haven't been traditionally used, composite wood materials. You know, I, I think that's great as a, as a model to think about broader areas in terms of energy use. Uh, so I think that's, that's sort of some of the areas that I think uh, are really interesting. But, I mean, that's only just touching on it. There are a lot of other areas, heating and cooling of buildings, energy storage and generation has already been mentioned today, um, water which I think Rob might mention a bit more and water efficiency, Some, I'm an Australian so you know water efficiency is naturally uh, a part of my being and there's been a lot of innovation driven by real need over there but you know there's still a lot, a lot of room to go in other countries uh, and, and I think Chris mentioned earlier on, so Chris mentioned uh, the idea of retrofit, the fact that we've got um, hundreds of uh, millions of buildings really sitting out there, they're a bit dumb, what could we do to those that are already existing? You know, e either they've been around for a hundred years or maybe less, uh, but you know, there's a lot to do there still with simple technologies to add on to them. Now, thank you very much. So, so Matt, perhaps, perhaps you could respond to that. Does that, does that <coughs> resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, for us, absolutely. Like, I think uh, it's um, a lot of the solutions, I, I, I like the kind of um, smart solutions for simple um, people, because I think for us, it's, it's, it goes back to a lot of our customer base is not, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's ultimately the many people. And so we need to be able to find simple solutions that can be applied at scale, um, that don't have a very high learning curve, that can, that can readily be plug, plug and play. 
And so I think um, that's an area that we are actively looking at for sure at IKEA. We um, an area called Home Smart or Smart Homes and um, what types of technologies and applications can we help customers with moving forward? And that touches just about everything from kind of how you control your energy to the type of lighting you use to um, how, you know, how you measure and reduce your water impact in, in the bathrooms and, and kitchens. And so um, for us, it's, um, you know, simple solutions, um, but, you know, intellectually robust and actually kind of well-designed um, priority one. Thank you. So, so Robert, I, I, I know that you've, you've, you've worked on an example, I think, that maybe crystallizes this notion of, of reuse and um, enhancement. So do you want to give us a quick account of that? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so I'm going to talk about a, a kind of case study, uh, which is um, a Cambridge-based company um, that's, that's working in solar power. Uh, and it really was something we talked about in designing the challenge uh, and trying to decide whether um, we thought um, that it was achievable to... to develop a product in, in about a year's time and have this scale of impact. Uh, the case study uh, arose serendipitously, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that now. So I guess uh, a way that the Earth, the Earth Hack could be really successful is, is to kind of create companies like this um, more repeatably. So, so the company is called Azuri Technologies, um, and Azuri means uh, beautiful in Swahili. So uh, you might guess, therefore, that the, the company's current focus is um, sub-Saharan Africa. So the, the, the objective of the company is to bring um, low-cost energy. Uh, the, the, the consumers of that energy are more interested in the cost and the environmental benefit, but also it happens to be uh, entirely renewable energy as well. Uh, and I guess there are, there are a couple of, of themes that have, have, have cropped up in the conversation already uh, that are relevant to this case. Uh, so I think it was uh, Sir Chris, or I think it was, uh, it was Matt from IKEA, in fact, who mentioned uh, number three. Number three, three billion uh, people emerging from poverty globally. And one of the things that I was personally very excited about in the Earth Hack is um, the global reach of the competition uh, and a real sort of opportunity to think about innovation, not just um, here, here in London, um, in New York, where we're going to award the prize, but also in Africa, India, South America, Australasia, um, and the impacts that we can have there. Uh, and it's highly relevant to the climate change problem because... Uh, the growth in, in carbon emissions that people like BP are still forecasting will predominantly come from the emerging world. Um, it's still growing in most of the developed world. Um, the UK is just about decreased its emissions, but only really because of that ash for gas. Um, but we're expecting to see large uh, growth in carbon emissions um, in China and Africa, South America. Uh, and um, I, I think when, when those countries attend uh, international climate change uh, conventions, that their argument is, you know, our citizens are, are interested in access to, to low-cost energy and a uh, better quality of life. So part of the innovation drive here is, is how, do we, how do we bring 3 billion people low-cost and sustainable energy and, and, and the quality of life that, that we enjoy here in the West? Uh, and so Zuri is, is part of, of, of that solution. Uh, I guess if, if you're looking for the scalability that Matt also was talking about, I mean, there are sort of two ways that you can do scalability uh, in, in climate change technology. You can mandate it with policy, and that does occasionally happen, uh, a good example being um, autom uh, automotive catalytic converters. So they happen because uh, the Californian and European governments kind of both pass legislation. So it's not without precedent, but I think with, with climate change, uh, the political processes have been pretty um, ineffectual to date in terms of dealing with the problem. So I guess the other way to really scale something um, you know, and have a huge impact on this problem is to offer value to large numbers of customers. Uh, and I, one of the things that Azuri does is it doesn't treat um, its customers as people who are poor. It treats them as customers who, who want to buy things and want to see, see great value. Uh, and I think um, for people who are interested in, in participating in the competition, that, you know, who's going to buy this, who's going to um, allow it to be scaled up is a really important part of um, developing a compelling solution that a, a big brand like Philips or Ikea might, uh, might, might take up. Um, and really what the Azuri system does is um, it, it, it consists of um, a small uh, solar panel, a battery, a couple of lighting um, units that are LEDs, um, uh, and a mobile phone charger. Uh, and um, these systems have been available in Africa for a couple of decades, uh, but they're very difficult to market because the cost of buying one of these systems up front 
is uh, prohibitive for most of the potential users. So there are about 600 million people in Africa um, who don't have access to grid who would want one of these systems, but very few of those have got the, the, the cash available to, uh, to buy it. Um, so what the company did is, is develop a way for offering um, almost like micro credits um, to users of the equipment. Uh, and it's developed a pay-as-you-go uh, business model that allows um, users to pay for the units in, in weekly installments. Uh, and the weekly installments are priced so they're significantly less than what those users are already spending on things like kerosene lanterns um, and paying somebody else to charge their mobile phones. Um, so it's all about um, offering a really transparent um, value proposition, but to come back to Matt's point, also making it very simple to use. The unit is uh, very simple. It's got some clever technology in it, uh, but it's got very few controls. It can be installed in a couple of minutes, uh, and there are thousands of people in Africa using these today uh, and, and deriving benefit from it. Uh, and, and the technology is all existing, so it uses uh, amorphous silicon soda cells, it uses um, the lithium-ion batteries that Richard mentioned earlier, uh, LEDs, uh, and a bit of encryption technology to, to protect um, the sort of uh, income stream. So it, it was not about um, developing a more efficient solar cell, although that was part of the, the genesis of the company. It really was about saying, how do we identify a group of customers who really are, could do better, you know, could do with a better solution, uh, and then delivering something that is, you know, it's technology, but it's not something that's taken years and years of R&D in a lab to develop. Um, and I think um, there are sort of tens of thousands of, of users of the technology today. If it's going to have um, a megaton of carbon type impact that we're looking for in this competition, then that business has to scale up. Yeah. Uh, and there are various elements to that. Uh, and actually, we touched on one of them today, talking about IKEA. IKEA is a, a global brand that consumers trust. And, and for a small company like Azuri, uh, one of the things that it needs to get right is establishing a brand that's recognizable. So if it offers different products to the market, um, customers will recognize that brand. There's a trusting relationship between the customer and Azuri um, and an ability to... Um, you know, offer new things uh, and see the sales uh, and impact uh, in terms of carbon savings grow. Um, so I guess I, I, you know, a lot of this um, sort of case has been about a business model um, that uses technology. Just, 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 uh, and just, I think um, for people I I entering the competition, thinking through the business opportunity that underpins um, your, your ideas um, is going to be very important and also a great opportunity for, for innovation. Uh, I think and really excited to see um, some interesting ways of getting some of these solutions into customers' hands. I think it's where IKEA and Philips can really help uh, because they spend all their time thinking about customers and, and driving their needs. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I'm very excited by the potential for another um, Azuri to, to, to come out of, of, of this, this challenge. And I should mention that you know, my, the company I work for, IP group invested in Azuri. We think it's a very exciting company. So yeah, any more of those, we'll definitely look at uh, making an investment in them. Great. I think, I think in the investment space, that's known as talking up your own book. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> an an honourable tradition. Just, well, just, Will, to, just um, maybe just that to stick with you, um, this notion that it's okay to think about smart, but surely you've got to be thinking about the business model that underpins this technology too. Yeah, I think that's, it, it's a real challenge. I mean, you know, there are a large number of, of homes out there, you know, and that's in, in the UK, across Europe, throughout the world, th throughout Asia, you know, every day, you know, uh, the amount of people urbanizing, as, as Matt mentioned, is just increasing, and the, and the speed at which people are building things like, uh, you know, apartment blocks in China is, <coughs> is astounding. Uh, I, I met with a, a developer in uh, China recently, and uh, they, their annual build rate is more than the entire construction of houses in the UK, and that's just one company. So, you know, th there are potential accesses into large-scale markets very quickly. Um, 
the real challenge I think comes around refurbishment and retrofit maybe in the more developed markets where you know, how do you get into these existing homes that already have a roof over their head, they already have, you know, they're already pretty, you know, most people are, you know, they're pretty happy with their homes. Uh, you know, how do you access them? How do you get technology rapidly deployed into that? Uh, you know, business models, uh, innovation is something that people in the building industry are, are, are thinking about more and more. So I think that's uh, an interesting idea, particularly particularly where, you know, some of the ex uh, building products are quite expensive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you make it an incremental investment, something that people can pay off uh, over time, perhaps. Um, I think as well, you know, uh, another thing that resonates with me in terms of what we've been talking about today is the ability to take technologies and innovations which are already out there and to break down some of the barriers that exist. You know, working in the industry for quite a long time, it's very siloized, you know, little people working on different components of the building, different bits and within your home, the cooker, the, the walls, the windows uh, separately. Um, and, you know, trying to bring those together and share them, uh, share ideas is, is a really great concept and something that doesn't happen all the time. Often it's left to some of the kind of more innovative architects to try to try that, but you know they're not going to achieve scale o overnight. So I think that's uh, that's something that this competition really offers. Great. And I think, think picking up that theme and sorry, was there? A sorry, just just <coughs> one comment. No, no. Picking up on on the last two speakers, I think um, maybe this is a comment to the to, to the Marblar community and how you start to think about the business case behind your idea. Um, the three words that I tend to look at when, I, when we're looking at new ideas at IKEA is desirability, um, affordability, and accessibility. And accessibility can hit a number of areas, whether it's just access at a store or whether it's the business model. And affordability can be a financing solution or, or, or looking at it in a very low cost structure. Um, but desirability, um, without desirability, um, you can forget about the last two. So um, when you're building your business case, think about kind of those three dimensions and frame your argument, frame your, frame your business plan around those because that really helps to communicate um, why someone would choose to buy this and how they will do that moving forward. Thank, thank you, Matt. Um, we are now going to move into uh, talking about some of the uh, entries to the competition that are getting the panel excited. But before we do that, are, are there any, any, any contributions that any of the panelists would like to make to uh, you know, the points we've been uh, listening to over the past few while. Yeah, no, I've got a couple. Um, in terms of um, helping the competitors uh, think about areas of, of technology uh, and coming back to this, this investment focus, um, there, are, there are a number of sort of relatively um, hot areas in clean tech at the moment. Water's quite, quite hot. Um, we'll, we'll mention that earlier. Um, Distributed generation, um, energy storage, um, Richard has alluded to low energy computing. Um, but the two of those that I think could be most relevant um, for uh, the Earth hack are um, distributed scale generation. So that is a sort of industry term that talks about rather than having electrical power generated at a big power station, having it distributed somewhere along the grid, it could be right down to the individual building. Uh, and, and someone who puts a solar panel on their house, that, that's distributed generation. Uh, and um, solar you know, works very well. It, it, it's close to grid parity um, in, in some sunny parts of the world already. Uh, but I think what we're going to see in the next five to 10 years is a big opportunity uh, for um, that local generation um, to become increasingly important part of home ownership. And there are a number of factors that play into this. I think one is that the grids that we in the West will come to rely on are going to become increasingly unreliable in the next five to ten years. Uh, so we're seeing that already uh, in the States. Uh, they have long blackouts every year in the US, which is ironic given it's the richest country in the world. Um, you see it all the time in, in the emerging world, in, in, in India and South Africa. Uh, and the UK, which has had a very reliable grid, is, is facing um, a, a grid crisis in the next five years. Uh, and so, so people are going to suddenly not just see their uh, bills continue to go up, but they'll start to get interruptions in their supply. Uh, and energy is going to move towards uh, being more of a local thing that you want to take responsibility for yourself. And governments, frankly, and Western governments in particular, can't afford to do anything about this. This is going to be, in my view, uh, much more about consumers uh, making these investments. And a really good example of this is in Japan. Uh, so that's a very developed uh, economy, wealthy economy. 
Uh, and uh, Japanese government has for years backed fuel cell technology, uh, and the fuel cells have not been commercialized for years until the Fukushima disaster. Uh, and there was a, a national uh, and almost unexpected response to that, where suddenly uh, Japanese consumers in their tens of thousands started buying um, fuel cell units for their homes. And these are very expensive. They cost $25,000, uh, and they produce far less than, than a, a solar panel. But suddenly people's perception of what they wanted from energy has changed, uh, and I think there's, there's a big consumer move towards not trusting utilities or governments, wanting to have uh, local control of their energy. So I think um, micro-combined heat and power, micro-generation is going to be very interesting in the next few years. Um, the other area I mentioned was energy storage. Uh, and energy storage is an area where governments are trying to intervene in their funding, big research programs. And people have this belief that, well, if you have lots of um, uh, renewable energy, wind, solar, uh, then we'll need some form of store that um, will compensate for the times when the wind isn't blowing and, and, it, and it's nighttime. Um, the problem with, with that sort of grid scale storage vision is that grids are really inefficient in terms of new technologies. So the, the, the companies that own grids are uh, optimized to look after them, but not really optimized to introduce new technologies. Uh, and I think um, I have an intuition that domestic scale storage, so literally a battery pack or some other storage system in your home is going to become very important in the next few years. And that's not just about technology, that's about business model. It's about how you sell that energy back to the grid, it's about smart grids. So I think um, entries in that direction could be quite interesting. Uh, and with brands like Akira and Philips, um, a home energy storage that's smart, that, that can make money for the consumer by marketing that power back to the grid would be, would be something that, that could really come out of this competition. Great. Thank, thank you, Robert. So, uh, Dan, how is the Marblar community responding to this challenge? What, you know, what's come through? What is uh, making the judges excited right now? Actually, there's been quite a few ideas. I think the last time we've had over 140 or so different product ideas that have come through on how we could, uh, you know, reimagine existing technology towards the home. And Robert and Will have been uh, very active on quite a few of those. And I want people to know at, at uh, who are watching, who have uh, submitted, who have not submitted. You know, nearly all the, uh, or I should say, every single one of the ideas are being reviewed by the judges. Um, and overwhelming, they're also you're getting feedback on all of your ideas. You know to know, you know, are they feasible or some, some advice on what we would need to do to move them forward. And I know uh, uh, Harry from Phillips and Matt from, from Ikea are also looking at all the ideas. So if you're looking for, you know, to share them, please do. But some of the, some of the few that have caught Robert's eye and Will's eye, my eye lately, um, uh, I, I wanted to talk about right now. One of them, and uh, Robert and Will, I want to hear you guys' thoughts. Uh, to begin with, it was about evaporative cooling via fabric wicking. Uh, to be used in developing countries. Now, this is actually very interesting because, you know, here in the UK, and uh, Robert and Will could touch on, upon this a bit more, uh, we always really think about how, how can we stay warm? Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's June right now in London, but we're bundled up. Um, but most people in the world don't have to worry about that. And so what, what, what about this idea makes you excited, Robert? Thanks, Dan. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is another idea uh, that's targeted at the, at the uh, developing world. Um, coming back to the, to the Azuri case study. Uh, and it's about um, intelligent use of appropriate technology to deliver a, a, very, a very clear consumer benefit. Um, the physics and science behind it is quite sophisticated, uh, but the implementation could be relatively simple. Uh, and I think um, uh, cooling of buildings um, is a much bigger problem, ultimately, than, than keeping buildings warm. You can build if you use modern techniques that Will was referring to earlier, you can build a building that will stay warm even in, in a cold climate, uh, but in a, lot, in a lot of the southern uh, or equatorial latitudes, it's keeping buildings cool that's consuming large quantities of energy. Uh, and as, and as um, the emerging economies industrialize, if they all start installing uh, big mechanical um, you know, air conditioning units, that is going to consume huge quantities of electrical power. Um, so trying to find um, sort of smart ways of, of cooling those, those buildings uh, can be really exciting. I, I love it because it's uh, very similar to, a, 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 again, this sort of application of some of the traditional technology. If, if you Google uh, CoolGuardy Safe, you'll come up with an Australian version of that from about 100, 150 years ago. So it's, a, it's, a, it, you know, it, it's about finding those ideas and finding modern applications, which are great. That's great. And, and ju just, you know, as a, as a biochemist, so I'm, I'm you know, Definitely not an engineer, but 
we, we cool our bodies via evaporative cooling. That's the reason why we sweat. So, you know, this sort of a biomimetic approach to trying to cool a building, I think it's just really exciting. And this came, uh, just, just for you guys know, it came from a postdoc who's at uh, ETH uh, Zurich. And so he was not in the UK, but not in the US. He was a, he's a young man in, in Zurich who's an engineer. Um, and he submitted that idea. And we're really excited about it. Another idea that really, really caught me um, was from a, a young man uh, from Utah, actually. He's a, he's a student uh, in, in Utah, and he uh, submitted an idea about a more intelligent uh, shower head. Um, and so usually we don't think about making shower heads very smart, or we don't really think about them that much. We might think about the, you know, the nozzle in our, in our water, we might think of our actual uh, behavior use, we might think about you know, uh, ways of just, or uh, hopefully not showering less, but um, how, how is it that uh, you know, some of these more intelligent shower heads to kind of track and report water use, you know, is that feasible? Is that really gonna, gonna make a dent, uh, Will, Robert, um, everyone else? I mean, from a water use perspective, you know, showers are definitely a big user of, uh, of energy and water because they use hot water, obviously, commonly. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely a great place to look for, for, for innovation. And I like the idea that, uh, you know, in this entry as well, there is a kind of, again, that sort of digital aspect, the integration of what is fairly simple, fairly, at the moment, you could say dumb products, uh, adding a sort of element of smart to it. Uh, and then suddenly you access the world of you know engagement within the web and online, tracking things, getting data back, you know, engage engagement in some kind of uh, game platform potentially. You know, there's lots of ideas and lots of places this can go. And then you know, again within the home, this is just one product. But what about where does it sit within a network? What about your taps? What about your uh, you know what about your toilet? You know, all, all the other areas in the home where you use energy or water. Tapping this together, and I think you know, if the Philips guys were here, I think they'd they'd be uh, uh, really telling you how excited they are about sort of thing. Great, Dan. Um, so, and then one more one more idea I actually uh, wanted to to talk about this one. Um, this is again about water because you know sometimes we we might not appreciate it. You know, aside from aside from our heater, aside from our uh, from our lights, um, aside from our appliances, um, water use is a big problem uh, when it comes to you know the amount of energy that that that's consumed. And maybe Sir Sir Chris and Sir Richard could jump in real quick. But you know, when it comes to transporting the water to the home, when it comes to heating the water, uh, we might not think about it. But you know, every time you turn on the tap, even if it's cold water. You know, carbon is going into the atmosphere, and it's something to be to be really thinking about. And whether it's you know just feedback back to the user, back to the operator to let them know, hey, it's been 20 minutes in the shower. Is it, you know is it time to it's time time to leave? Or um or or, or ways to recycle um some of the water use in the home. Another another great um idea came by of actually saving some of the bath and and shower water and and uh, reappropriating that towards flushing toilets. But um. Uh, you know, maybe just to, to loop in Sir Chris and Sir Richard and uh, and Harry, uh, when it comes to, to saving water in the home, um, you know, what what are some what, what would a good idea look like? And in your opinion, and you know, are enough people really thinking about this really domestically, not just you know in a third world, but in you know maybe in urban areas of how we could we could make that happen? Okay, well, maybe um, I should can... we should we go with with uh, Chris first? Okay, I lost the connection right for a couple of minutes, so I'm not sure I heard everything. But I think the um, water use is uh, critical in many parts of the world, and it does also, transporting water takes some few percentage of energy, so it's important for energy too. I think in the home, actually, I don't know the rest of the world, but in the UK, the most important thing anybody could do is meter everybody's water. I mean, rather, I, I don't know the percentage. I mean, I have a meter and I pay by the amount. But a lot of people pay a fixed charge and water's free. And that always uses to overuse. So it's a very, very simple, low-tech solution. Stick a meter in. Yeah, I, I think there's, a, there's an interesting concept there. And then a lot of the issues in the home to do with sustainability and to make becoming more sustainable is really about looking at waste, looking at waste water, waste energy. It's stuff that it, you know, has been up to now relatively cheap in the, in the Western world. So uh, it's not really thought about. So either technologies that engage you like metering and make you think about what you're using or technologies which help to eliminate the waste by modifying your behavior or, or doing something in a way that, that makes uh, re removing waste simple, that's, that's a really good line to follow in terms of innovation. Mm. And, so, um, 
and Richard, Matt, did, did y'all have any any thoughts on that in, in terms yeah. of you know the water use? Uh, well, I, well, let me pick up on the uh, the, the grey water uh, issue. That's that's really important. Um, I mean, Chris mentioned it, but the energy involved in pumping water large distances is really tremendous. I mean, it, it, it's extremely environmentally unfriendly to pump clean water, use it when it could have been dirty water, uh, and then pump it uh, uh, probably a similar distance to be treated. So, uh, I mean, Chris is right. Water metering is very important, but some of the UK water um, supply companies will uh, reduce... Uh, will give you credit if you arrange that um, water that runs off your roof doesn't go into the main sewer, but you can take the, the, that relatively clean water and let it run off into your garden. They'll give, if you could prove that you do that, they'll give you a discount on the, the amount that they charge for sewage. Um, whether that's a big enough discount, I don't know, but, but that's the sort of incentive which would make a difference. Uh, I mean, locally within the home, uh, yes, if you can... Um, if you can save water, I probably wouldn't save the bath water because it probably wouldn't stay very pleasant for very long. But anything that comes off the roof, I mean, that, that's well worth saving. Yeah, I think there's <coughs> a number of challenges um, when it comes to grey water management in the, in the house and more specifically in the apartments because that's where, at least for IKEA, where most of our customers actually reside. Um, there are things that you can do um, for sure. Uh, a lot of it involves structurally re-engineering your bathroom or your, or your kitchen to enable the plumbing to actually um, uh, facilitate that. But I think it's one of the things that IKEA we're actively trying to think about is how do you create the most sustainable bathroom? Um, and what are the elements that make a sustainable bathroom real? And that's water, that's mixing that with energy, that's um, actually the, all the different elements of not just mm. the types of materials that you use, air quality within the bathroom as well, and the implications of humidity and moisture within that. There are definitely applications that need to be considered around grey water management. Um, even if you live in countries like the UK and Sweden where water may not be really that much of an issue in the grand scheme of things today. Matt, thank you very much. And uh, we've, we've had some questions from some marblers. And uh, the first is from Aya Aguda. So, so Dan, what is the stance on waste products for marblers vision in the home? Is it part of the scope of energy efficiency? Absolutely, and I, I want to touch on this, and I could probably bounce back to um, to Matt as well. And uh, so, certainly, you know, if, if your solution and if your idea reduces the amount of waste um, in the home, then certainly we'd love to hear about it. Um, because when it comes to you know um, throwing away food, when it comes to throwing away other sorts of products in the home, it, it took a lot of energy to 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 you know produce that food. It took a lot of energy to transport. It took a lot of energy to, to transport. You know, a lot of the of the of the stuff we consume every day into the home, not just the organic um, uh, components. And so, if if your solution is how we could reduce overall waste in the home, then yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be knocking off carbon from our bill, and we'd love to hear about it. And I think uh, I think Matt and IKEA um, they're they're also looking for for solutions that reduce waste to, in and around the home as well. Matt, did you want to maybe touch on that? Just. Um I'll reiterate that. I mean, one of the things that, um, as a consumer, you will continue to consume. I would like to find ways that you can reduce that amount of consumption going and the volume of material going into your house. But one of the things that, once it is in your house, effectively sorting that and bringing it into multiple different waste streams that we can actually capture in the most efficient way, such that you can repurpose those materials or products, um, is something that we are actively looking at. How do you enable customers to actually effectively sort their, their waste in the most environmentally friendly and sustainable way. Um, if you actually look at organic waste, most people can, can, can eliminate 30 to 40% of their garbage by actually separating it into a compost facility. How do you actually enable that individual at an apartment or a home to easily create a compost, um, <coughs> which then can lead to allow them, allowing them to grow their own vegetables at home? These are solutions that allow you to become much more independent at a local level, even at, even at a home level. And um, if there are solutions like that that you can dream up or think about or scale, um, absolutely. Thank you. We've come to the time of the Hangout where I am going to ask Dan to, to wrap things up. But the critical point now is how do we participate in the challenge? You know, what are the themes people should be thinking about? How do they get involved? 
No, absolutely. So I mean, you get involved uh, today. You go to marbler.com and you'll see our site right there on our on our homepage. Um, just click on the Climate Group logo, and it'll take you right to the uh, to the challenge page. And so, you know, we're asking people. You know, as um, has been mentioned in, in the panel, Will touched on several of the points. The same with Robert and 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 Chris and Richard. You know, you know, when it comes to systems in the home, could you could you think about you know ways to intervene in some of these systems? Could you think about ways to intervene? Um, in terms of the waste usage, could you think of reimagining some appliances, reimagining the design of the home, some of the materials that go into the home, and, and appropriating materials or design uh, concepts, both from nature or from other settings? Um, so there's various ways that you could really intervene into the home, um, you know, both in how it's constructed, when it's constructed, how it's disposed of. Um, you know, really from A to Z, we're taking we're taking solutions. It could be a, a software solution or a material solution. Or an appliance solution. Um, it could be big and small. You know, we're we're looking for all all types of ideas, and so we do really encourage you to think broadly. You know, rewatch some of this video. The Climate Group will be posting this. If you want to have some ideas, um, you could. You know, it's obviously anybody's welcome to to submit an idea, and you're also welcome. You know, if you have a question or a concern before you uh, share your idea, you can leave it in the discussion portion or in the Q and A, and all of our judges from uh, from IKEA from Philips. You know, Robert, Will, um, Climate Group, as well as Marvel are looking at the questions, and we're very happy to to discuss with you before you submit. And you could also give us a give us a shout on Twitter at Climate Group or at Play Marbler, um, if you if you want to reach us if you have any questions about the competition. There's also a um, a, a more in-depth FAQ than you want to read, um, but it's there on the competition <laughs> page as well. So you know, we're, we're really we'll be selecting finalists at the end of July. Um, we'll be shortlisting the 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 top concepts. But you know, part of our shortlisting process will be based on how well developed your idea is. So e even if your idea isn't complete, we encourage you to submit it because um, the rest of the Marbler community then gets to comment on it, leave you feedback as well as the judges, and it gives you additional time to really you know plump out your idea. And we're looking at the at the full body of the idea, which is an organic you know organism, and it's constantly being iterated and improved by the community. So you know, balance uh, preparing your idea with giving it enough time to. Uh, um, to really um, uh, fester on the community and to uh, and to gain some of that insight from the rest of your marblers, um, and ultimately we're hoping to shortlist you know maybe a dozen, maybe a little more than a dozen ideas um, in early August, and those will be further plumped out by the marbler community, and we're hoping that uh, uh, the or not we're hoping there will be one winner that will be crowned at the um, at the end of the competition and flown into New York. Um, to receive their prize at Climate Week New York, which is the um, the event to be at um, for the year, and so it's it's a, it's on top of just the the twelve thousand dollar cash prize. You're going to get a, a great trip to New York to meet with uh, some world leaders and to check out quite a few of the events around um, Climate Week New York. So, um, and Mark, uh, should, uh, do you want to add any thoughts to you know what what Climate Group is hoping to um, that, that the world gets out of this competition and what what a what we the, we hope the solution could look like. Well, I think there are probably uh, a couple of things we'd like. I, you know, obviously thinking big, we'd like someone to come up with something that not only saves a million tons of carbon, which is what the Earth Challenge is all about, but also something that's scalable by IKEA by others. So a million tons is just the starting point to ten million, a hundred million, and so on and so forth. But also, uh, as importantly, is to show people that everybody can get involved in this. Yeah. It's not waiting for somebody in a very fancy laboratory somewhere to come up with the answer that's going to solve all the problems. That's what some politicians may be hoping will happen, but the reality of it is we've all got a role to play and it can be a very exciting role. And we can all do our bit and come up with those solutions, not only for climate change, but for good living in the future. Well, thank you. And we've got a couple of questions come in from Marblars that relate to the process. So, so Dan, um, is there the potential for people with similar ideas to team up? Absolutely, you could submit your idea as a team. Um, you'll it'll be under one marbler uh, ultimately, but you, you're more than welcome to say in your idea who all the different marblers are on the team. You could submit as a company. Even there's companies out there have reached out saying, "Hey, we're developing a clean tech product that we think could save some energy in the home. Uh, we'd love to submit this idea to uh, uh, to the competition, knowing that the prize money will help kickstart our product." And so you can submit it as a team. You can submit it as a company. You can submit it as an individual. Um, you comment on your best on your favorite ideas, and you can vote on your favorite ideas. Many ways to interact. That's fantastic. So it really just remains for me to say thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, it's been a fantastic discussion. 
I hope everybody watching has really taken something from it. Thank you all very much. And on that note, we'd just like to say cheerio and join in the Earth Hack. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.